Welcome to another episode of Real Geeks, where, once again, thank the cinematic gods not named Christopher Nolan, we actually have new movies to review. It's about goddamn time. <laughs> and with that, with that level of enthusiasm, clearly this episode is going to be downright amazing. Uh, of course, uh, I am Mike Montgomery, I am joined by Vita, and Crash down on the bottom here. And today we are here to s discuss the film that Christopher Nolan somehow tried to convince the cinematic world for a very long time was going to save theaters the world over. Uh, that, of course, being the sci-fi temporal spy thriller, Tenet. And since, look, let's, let's be honest, just trying to explain the plot of this movie is going to take at least a half hour. So we're just going to cut to a trailer and then come back with our thoughts on the movie. What are these blitzers like us? Travelling forwards through time. The other one's going backwards. Can you tell which is which? How about now? Why does it feel so strange? You're not shooting the bullet. You're catching it. Whoa. I didn't went back in myself, felt like hell. Work, I risked it, pace yourself. Are you living? No, you thrilling off a sin. How I got my strikes and pendants back in out in the street. What is wild, let it be. Rage is out, gotta eat. Not a vibe, but away with the sound. By the way, kind of down by the days. Who's the American? He seems nice. I invited him to the dinner. Good with fists for a diplomat. There are people in the future who need us. You got something. Not gonna like it. Time isn't the problem. Getting out alive is the problem. Close the opera. Hit a red and blue outside, I think our options are I'm gonna have to find them, never had to line it up I have no idea what you're getting yourself into if you go through that door. It's slow motion when I dance. Well, I'm going, so any tips will be welcome. Ain't no time on face scans. What do you think we're saying? The detritus of a coming war. You want to crash a plane? Well, how big a plane? That part is a little dramatic. So, Tenet, of course, stars John David Washington, and 
this being the first time I've seen this man on screen, I will just say, man, can you hear Denzel? Yeah. No, it, like it's it's a great performance. Yeah. It's definitely like okay. Uh, I know that Christopher Nolan has been working on the script for like ten or twenty years, off and on. Oh wow, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like that's the way Christopher Nolan works. Like when he was in his uh, teens and twenties, he had like a lot of good but vague ideas, and he's just been sitting and brooding on them for years. Mm -hmm. What if it was a dream? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if love was an equation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Batman. Well, so Washington stars as the protagonist, also known as the only character in this movie who does not actually have a name. Also, yeah, yeah, like, I, I'm, uh, I'm just going to jump. No, actually, no, ignore me. I'm going to cut this out. You go ahead. Uh, we'll get to it. <laughs> uh, but also... Um, I plan to bring up uh, this comment that I made in our, our first recording a bit later, but since, uh, Mickey, you had uh, brought up how, the amount of time Nolan tends to take with his ideas, what, one of the things that I had said the first time we attempted to record this was how, like, you know you know that story you wrote when you were, like, 14 with the, the mysterious character protagonist who is thrust into this plot where he has to save the world and he's the only ma only person like equipped for the job and so on and so forth as complex and deep as this movie at least wants to be it's it's basically that with a 200 million dollar budget yeah what wants to be is the main thing yeah. here because it, it looks like a christopher nolan uh showpiece it acts like a christopher nolan showpiece there are all the hints of it and yet you, at the end of it, you're like, I think that was oddly shallow. Like, the protagonist, the protagonist, yeah. is a complete Mary Sue. Um, and it's like, it's present in, in a lot of coincidences that occur. Like, oh, uh, so at the beginning of the film, there is an un seemingly unrelated uh, terrorist event. Uh, during a uh, orchestral concert in the Ukraine, I believe. And uh, he is part of the team that is meant to sneak into this terrorist hostage taking and remove a single person uh, or an object that that yeah. person is, is in, in, uh, um, in possession of uh, uh, because that person is apparently the true target of this entire attack and their uh, secret agent who has been burned. And it's a, it is a great sequence, but... Let's all go to the... His entire team gets killed, and he attempts to commit suicide with a uh, CIA cyanide pill, which is apparently fake, and the either... Like, there's, there's a lot of loose ends in this. Either the KGB were just like, ah, oh, he died. Let's throw his body back to America and not bother to check it. Or the KGB were actually CIA doing a double bluff that, that to, to prove that one guy was loyal and they completely killed an entire team, countless terrorists, uh, injured who knows how many people in that orchestra, yeah. and uh, a bunch of Russian cops. And it's like... Oh, what the fuck? And the, the entire purpose of it is so that we can get our protagonist, who doesn't have a name or identity, to the point that they don't have a name or an identity. To do what I do, I need some idea of the threat we face. Tenet is an espionage story. It's, it's a classic spy story. I grew up loving spy movies, but to make it sing to today's audiences, I sort of felt like for me to really engage with it, I wanted it to have bigger possibilities. Time travel? No. Inversion. Well, the film deals with this concept of inversion, which is the idea that the entropy of an object or a person could be reversed. It's very much cinematic. It's something that you have to see on the screen to fully engage with. Name it and pull the trigger. 
You're not shooting the bullet. You're catching it. Whoa. Yeah, so it's literally so, them just doing everything yeah. backwards. Ugh. What, Which... you know, what incredible feat to have done it well. Yeah, like for for the most part, it looks great. It's just the fact that they pulled it off at all is a thing of beauty. But yeah. during that first fight, that fight sequence in Norway, there's a point where uh, the fight between the two versions of our protagonist, the one that's in the SWAT gear, at what there are, there's a point where he's, for lack of a better term, sliding along the ground and just like flailing around. Yeah. It doesn't, like, it looks so strange. Well, not, not only that, but when when we return to that fight in the second half of the film, because there, the, the film book, like, is a fucking book. There's, mm. there's one bit, there's the middle when everything pivots, and then it folds back in on itself. So, like, when we get back to that fight, you're expecting, okay, so that's going to make sense. He was crawling for the gun or something. No, no, no. It looks even weirder because he wasn't doing anything. He was literally flailing on the ground, but now that it's in forward motion, it looks yeah. even dumber and renders the entire previous fight, which which was odd but cool, kind of lamer. Um, One of the things that got me about that sequence was... The protagonist was actually there in three different spots. Yeah. Also, and once, <clears throat> once you realize what's going on and the inverse of things, and they're coming up on the inverse fight at in Oslo, you're like, okay, I bet you, I bet you, because you know you see in his arms starting to hurt, and you're like, yeah, this dude, is the he was fighting like... with himself. Yeah. 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 But then there's the there's I mean the two of them show up so there's the inverse and there's the future non-inverse whatever yeah. and yeah. that's when you realize he's there in three different three different sections yeah there's yeah. like three copies of them all in one spot and how does that not break things well that's the thing is they intentionally go out of the way to say don't don't come into contact with yourself yeah. things will get really bad yeah, and yeah. Oh, they, i don't have time to put the suit on right so it's like okay storytelling 101 says if you don't put that suit on you're going you or someone with you who didn't put that suit on is going to have that effect and they're going to die or almost die nothing nope nothing 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 it had nothing it had nothing you like, like at best, uh, like with the uh, the car crash sequence and the hypothermia in the explosion, it there's it looks like something, yeah, but there's intentionally that loophole that's left there so they don't have to actually do anything. Yeah, would that be the grandfather clause? <laughs> no, that is not the grandfather clause. But that's the, that's the weird thing is, like, I like aspects of that. I like yeah. the idea that the explosion actually had an endothermic response. He got cold. And it's like, okay, but where is that energy coming from? Is it is it that, like, was there a moment when he was completely blown apart and burned and he got pulled back together? Like, when the bullet goes through you, and I, I understand they, they tried to make that work, and it's like, that really doesn't work unless you had that bullet hole in you your entire life. Somewhat. You know, like, the, in, yeah. the inverse mechanics doesn't work. The subjectivity of it doesn't actually work. Someone has to be in the direct uh, path um, of, of progress for there to be uh, uh, that bullet somehow there. Um, but wouldn't he have been completely fucked up by that explosion before the explosion? Wouldn't he be suffering the same problem after the explosion that she suffered after she got shot? What about the uh, endothermic uh, response that would have come from a, a red hot bullet uh, and the friction of going? Through? It's just, I, I want this film to be better. I want, no, actually, well, I'll tell you what I want. I want this film to be worth uh, endangering lives as the director demanded. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that like you wanted this to be what Nolan actually promised. Yeah, instead of like, yeah, it's decent. Yeah. This is your forgettable film. No one is going to give a shit about this. It's always going to be like, oh yeah, and Tenet. 
you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's no Inception. It's not even integrated. That's uh, just it. Like there was, when I, in the theater that I was at, <clears throat> the showing that I was at, there were 10 people, including myself in the whole theater, which was great because social distancing, you know, people behind, people over to the side, and then there were a row of, you know, there was one row further down, and there were five guys who were all there together. At one point in time, one of the guys pulls out his phone and he's fucking scrolling during the, during the movie. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. It, and uh, when we left, when we left, I heard somebody say Inception was better. Yeah. How did that happen? I'm wearing a mask. Here we are. Back to the movies. I, I, I ran into Trevor uh, on my way out of my uh, first screening of the movie, and I, I specifically told him that I, th this movie's biggest issues are going to be two things. One, the average movie-going audience is going to have a damn hard time following this thing, uh, which goes straight back to uh, Vita's mentioning of the dude with the cell phone. Yeah. And two, Christopher Nolan's ego. Because quite, like, quite simply, <laughs> he has set the expectations for this movie far, far too high. Um, and especially where another thing that I mentioned to Trevor is that I feel like this is Nolan trying to do Inception again. Yeah, and Inception, while a great film, uh, does not stand up to much rewatch. You start seeing yeah. major flaws in its uh, methodology. Um, and uh, well, I think it's a Rick and Morty joke where it's, um, you don't have to pretend that Inception was smart. You don't have, you're not impressing anyone. You don't have to pretend that Inception is smart. No, and, but also by that same logic, uh, Tenant suffers from a lot of the issues that any sequel to a surprise hit film would. And Inception was a surprise film. No, it was. Yeah, like, there, there was... This is a spiritual sequel. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, ev like, everything that we see in Tenet, in a lot of ways, we, we've seen before, whereas Inception was, like, just so such a wow factor because there was so much there conceptually, visually, and so forth that a lot of people just hadn't seen before but now with now with this being a Christopher Nolan movie, like that's kind of what you expect I think this might be the first black man uh, that uh, uh, has been in a lead in a Christopher Nolan film I think uh I don't know for certain, but off the top of my head, I would say yes. I mean, if nothing else, I certainly can't think of another one. Yeah, this this is actually possibly the most prominent person of color, aside from Morgan Freeman. Oh, in the Batman yeah, d definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that um, aspects of uh, how how white spy thrillers tend to be um were were clearly like exaggerated yeah. by the, the the juxtaposition um a juxtaposition that clearly came in a bunch of times when uh protagonist i, I hate calling him that protagonist i know um was met with a lot of like subtle racism and judging uh by people of just like oh you're moving in the wrong circles but it never became anything you know it's like okay but have it become something. It's mentioned a bunch yeah. of times. People look at him and go like, ha, you're poor. <laughs> yeah, you're in the wrong spot. Yeah. 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 We're, we're you know, like going into the restaurant to meet um, Michael Caine's character. Yeah. You know, like they judge him immediately. And yes, they, they're referencing 
his clothing, but really he's also the only white or black guy in a clearly white male establishment. You know, it's very obvious what they judged first. And um, again, the uh, the ending uh, has a, a twist uh, where it's like, oh, he was the main guy all along. Who is Tenet? He is Tenet. Who's actually doing this? He is doing this. Who is the who do you think is the bad guy for half the film him but he's not and it's like okay so he in the end holds more power than any of these people could ever possibly believe and they're all dancing to his strings why was that not more of a direct line because it's the future protagonist who's actually the uh anti in, a, antagonist yeah but we don't find that out until later on and there's that one line where Robert Pattinson's character is like, we've known each other for a very long time. And protagonist is like, dude, I just met you. Like, no, see, uh, future you met yeah. past me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like, that that exchange of power, that, that seeming imbalance that is at the beginning and, and is not there, like the, the inverse that is at the end, that's never addressed. There's never a moment where Michael King goes, oh, dearie me. He was actually my boss. Oh, <laughs> my God. You know, like, that, that that power dynamic never gets addressed, which is a shame because it seems to actually be the main point of his film, is that one thing in reverse is the opposite. <gasps> and that's the whole fucking thing about this goddamn movie. It's, it's everything is red team, blue team, <laughs> like this, like this. We're gonna have yeah. one going at the beginning. Some... We're gonna have another one coming at the end. And they'll be inverse, and we're gonna learn from. Uh, just yeah. Okay. There, I'm just here for the ride, man. Just I'm gonna watch the movie. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Christopher Nolan is likes to think he's this brilliant storyteller, but he's actually an attraction. Um, he he designs set pieces and then goes and fills in the uh, the rest of it later. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing because his set pieces are fantastic. That battle at the end is great. The reverse fight that he has halfway through the film where you first get to see uh, uh, the, the stuff like the time dilation, time reversal stuff go, it's really well done. And I assume a bitch to a film. Oh, I don't even want to think about how that was filmed. Uh, well, yeah, like that was, uh, those sequences are entirely practical. I think another thing, though, I will say is that uh, Robert Pattinson, for for some for someone like me who has never seen his uh, more like lower profile indie work, like I off the top of my head, I think this is the only thing that I've seen him in outside of Twilight. You haven't seen The Lighthouse? No. I I uh, I heard about the animatronic bird. I refuse to watch it. Oh, but it's so. <laughs> God. Yeah, but I mean, I know it's an animatronic bird, but it's supposed to be a real bird, and I heard what happens to the bird, and I don't want to watch it. But it's I also haven't watched. Bird. Yeah, I, I also haven't watched Old Yeller because I know what happens to the dog. Yeah, but that's that was fair. a real dog. This is a robot bird. I don't you care. Know it's a robot. I don't care. It's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I, I will say for Pattinson, uh, there's. At the point in the film where they're planning the, hei the heist in the free port, uh, which for people who don't know or haven't like haven't seen the movie yet, it's it's basically a tax-free uh, shelter for art or whatever rich people want to store, because we've apparently let the rich few decide how like all of society works. But yeah. like that—that's a whole well, video in and of itself. That really expensive, really well-known painting, but you don't want to pay the taxes for having owned that. Come store it over here, and you can visit it once in a while, like a safety deposit box in the bank. And that way, you technically still own it, but you haven't technically taken ownership of it, so you're not paying taxes on the value of it. Or specifically, it hasn't entered any country, therefore it's not under anyone's law or tax law. Yeah. Um, but when we see uh, Pattinson's character, Neil, uh, getting the tour of the facility and clearly casing the joint, <laughs> like, I don't know about you guys, but I was just sitting there like, yeah, that's Bruce Wayne. Yeah. I'm sold. 
yeah, no, it's a good point. He is he is nonchalantly bad as a investigator of just like, wow, this guy's got so much money, he just he just doesn't give a shit. And he sold it in that way very well. He's going to be a very good Bruce Wayne. Oh, yeah. But the oddness of it definitely uh, uh, made me think of later on um, during the actual, the, the first time that uh, we visit the uh, the robbery in Oslo. Um, and uh, uh, the protagonist just starts hyperventilating and like wanders off. And it's like, you're in a secured area acting super weird and you just left the tour group. That guy is totally going to tell security to keep a good fucking eye on you. Instead, Robert Patterson just goes, yoga. And it's like, no, no, no. He no. just went around a blind corner acting super weird in a place that has, like, so much fucking security, you're going to hit it with a jet. Someone's watching him doing this. Yeah, yeah you were saying. He was trying to regulate his breathing to expand his lung capacity for when the fire suppression thing hits. And, you know, it's gases and... Ten seconds, you say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Robert Pattinson doesn't do any of this stuff and has the same amount of lung capacity. Less than, actually, I think. Less. <laughs> it, 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 like, that's the thing. He should have had less than. He should have passed out halfway through that, and then the protagonist should have kept going because he made the proper plans for it, which should have been a, a more clear character thing of, like, he's the only one who survives because he makes the proper plans. He's the one who's tenant at the very end of this whole thing at, like, decades in the past, in the future because he's the one that makes the decade-long plans. Nope. Audiences have never seen anything like this before. It's a swift, kind of action-packed adventure movie. There are certainly images that I have never seen before on screen. It's a really hair-raising, high-stakes thriller from an extraordinary filmmaker. All right, so I think uh, at this point, uh, let's just go into ratings. And since, ironically enough, this is the second time we're also recording this part, well, third technically, but fuck it. <laughs> Uh, once again, uh, Mickey, um, you're gonna go first, cause, <laughs> oh, this is so good, I need to hear it twice. <laughs> right oh, absolutely. Uh, I give this film half a looper. It is half <laughs> a looper. If you enjoyed Looper, you'll enjoy this half as much. It's not a Jordan, uh, 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 uh Gordon Levitt, uh, it is definitely, though, a Bruce Willis. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, Vita, if you've uh, recovered enough there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm still standing by my two. I know that the, the fates keep giving us opportunities to change our ratings, <laughs> but I'm standing by my two, God damn it! No, 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 no. The fates are giving Mike an excuse to change his rating. Yours is perfectly fine. <laughs> but as I've said, uh, if you're able to watch this numerous times, and you have the patience for it, and you're able to catch all the stuff, it might go as high as a four. Um, casting was well done. The actors bring a lot of stuff to their roles. They, I don't have any issue with the actors. Uh, the action sequences were big and loud and cool um but the plots the twist the storyline just it, i i'm staying by my two it's just there's you would have to watch it numerous times and i don't think anyone wants to pay the price for the ticket no um and as as i said the first time we tried to do this part and i'm, I'm, I'm screw you quick time i'm standing by this um uh, Actually, very uh, similar to uh, Vina's logic, uh, I'm giving it a four, but a four with a caveat. Or like, yeah, four, like l l there's, a, there's a little star there. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, like, th there is there is a lot of really good stuff here. Uh, does the story come together in service of those really good elements? Not really. This is not the movie Chris Nolan wants you to think it is. It's not. Um, and 
there's like there are a lot of little things that you'll notice over repeated viewings over time which uh, like, as much as I love that about a movie at the same time I can say the same thing about the shadow and needless to say the two films are not exactly on the same plateau now in the other attempt that we had of recording this you brought up something that I missed at the end of the movie, we see that Neil has the um, the Chinese coin, the good luck coin, on his backpack. And you said that you noticed in your second time watching the movie that you see yeah. him all throughout the movie. He is there throughout the whole thing, not just the scenes where he's actually on screen. Yeah, he actually dies <laughs> on screen. Uh -huh. It just goes like, because you yeah. have no fucking idea that that's what's happening. Oh, yeah, no, that that moment was way too fast. Yeah. Um, but like at, at the end of the day, it's as simple as as much as yes, I loved and enjoyed the movie. I don't need to go back, and this is a hundred percent the wrong time for this movie to come out in the first place. Uh, because like, as much as Christopher Nolan was, <laughs> Chris like Nolan fought for every single. Uh, release date this thing had. He did. He wanted this thing out in July, which this no thing would have made a really good summer blockbuster. Yeah. Kids are all home from school. Uh, there's no worry about having to stay out late. So either March break or summertime blockbuster, this would have been it. Pre-COVID. Yeah. Yeah. In the normal world. Yeah. No. This yeah. would have been. This would have made its budget back. Uh, absolutely. I don't think it would have made a billion dollars, but would have been a successful film. But in, in a COVID world, this is not worth it. No. No, like, the simple fact is, especially looking at the States, you're releasing a film that needs to be seen multiple times in, in, in this. Yeah. At least here in Nova Scotia, our numbers are, are, are okay. Yeah. They're, they're not awesome. They're okay. We can go to the movie theater without worrying too much about exposure. I don't even want to think about the States. I really don't. That place just scares the shit out of me. Oh, no. I, I don't blame... Like, uh, my my <laughs> favorite uh, film critics over at Double Toasted, are very, like, especially Corey, the main host, is very adamant about the fact that... No, I don't care what movie it is. I'm not... You send me a screener. I'm not going to the theater. Yeah, and they get screeners. How do we get those? Well, you, you have you have to have clout. Very specifically, <laughs> yeah. um, tenant uh, tenant was not sent out in screeners, nor I believe was New Mutants. They intentionally wanted critics to go out of their way and endanger themselves to promote this movie and that other movie. Oh, the, they wanted critics to go to the theater for Unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you right now. Oh, oh, and Antebellum. Uh, actually, Antebellum. I don't. Have I even heard about that one? It's a Janelle Monae slavery horror, but apparently it's just gore and no plot or no no themes. It thinks it's it's this brilliant counter to Birth of a Nation, and is actually just kind of like. Yep, it's like slavery porn. So it's basically most horror movies. Yeah, it's yeah. like an Eli Roth film. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but, so, yeah, with that, like I said, I would have no problem recommending this movie in, in certain scenarios. We're kind of not really living those out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, with that, until uh, next time, and depending on the order they get posted, it's going to be either New Mutants or uh, our, our previously recorded review of 2018's Upgrade, an actually good horror movie. Uh, but uh, and, until whichever one of those we do, um, you can uh, find stuff that I'm trying to sell at adipose.redbubble.com uh, If you like uh, adipose Doctor Who related merchandise that's not ridiculously fucking generic Again, I have issues 
Do you? Do a little, you? Little, little bit. Really? <laughs> Did not know that. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, Crash, what about you? What do you got going on? Uh, I am currently in the rollout of season three of Here You Go Productions' various things, including this brand new look. Ooh, isn't it so vintage theater? Yay. Uh, so I'm currently going to be rolling that stuff out for the next month and a half in celebration. Watch it. <laughs> And, uh, finally, uh, Vita? Well, um, it's COVID. It's pandemic. So I'm at home when I'm not working my day job making masks and masks and masks. Um, have I mentioned I'm making masks? <laughs> <laughs> I can be reached. Uh, I, I do have other stuff on my website as well, but, um, I'm, I'm not really promoting a lot of it. Um, I actually just had a jewelry sale last week. A guy was, a guy heard about uh, room closet and checked out the site and he goes, Oh, she doesn't ship to the States. I was like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Just send me a message. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm making masks. So I have over a hundred prints available to choose from. Cause seriously, the fabric store just wants all my money. <laughs> But uh, I cater to geeky prints. I cater to, uh, I've got a lot of kid-friendly ones because school's heading back in soon. Um, and I can be reached via out of the broom closet at hotmail.com or Facebook. So. And if you know where you can find a fabric pattern based on the 80s sitcom mask, please get in touch with Vita immediately because I want a mask mask so badly. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hold up this end for just one moment. Um, in Central America last week, an entire yeah. truck, like a shipment of mask toys was discovered. Untouched. Undone. I know. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Like, needless to say, if I, if I had money and space <laughs> and the ability to go to Central America, I would be buying that warehouse. <laughs> Uh, I'll, ha I'll have to take a peek and see if I can find anything. No promises. Oh, no. <laughs> like, li literally, I've, I've tried on Google, and you would have to sort through five pages of just, like, sites selling uh, COVID masks. But, I mean, in a few months, I'll have all kinds of pretty Doctor Who fabric. This is... A, well... We already, we already know that I've already got that order in. <laughs> yep. All right, but and, until next time, and assuming quick time, we'll actually let this work. I hope so. See ya. <laughs>